Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really a technology investment banker, and I've spent the last 15 years in between on the research side and also on the asset management side, but really around technology. And what I'm going to talk to today is talk a little bit about what I see in the transport area and what I see in the energy area and what it means for you. Uh, please just excuse the fact that I'm not a mining expert, but I do, I think, have a good idea in terms of what's happening in the end products, which at the end of the day is incredibly important for what you're, what you're doing. What I would say by starting off is, it's going to be complex. The next 10 years are going to be complex. And you really have to be very, very careful with your money and what you're going to do with it. Because the world is not just from an economic point of view changing, it's also from a technological point of view changing as well. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So if we went back to the, the Industrial Revolution, what we realized is the Industrial Revolution is about two things. It's about energy and it's about transport. That's what kicked it off. And the Industrial Revolution just happened to kick off in Germany, the UK, and then it went into the US. And what actually, if you look at, and you look at how we separated ourselves from, in particular, China, it was, in, it was because of these two technologies, right? And these two technologies allowed us really to have a massive increase in GDP um, over this period of time. Then we came to the beginning of the 20th century, and we had another one. We had an oil, and we had transport. Again, this is led by Germany, this is led by the UK, this is led by the US, and another massive boom in GDP. And actually, if you look today, you can see that you know, a lot of the businesses that were founded at that period of time are still dominating today. So the remnants of Standard Oil are the, still the big oil companies in the world. If I look at Bosch, Siemens, GE, they're all founded at this period of time, right? And again, you see nothing happened in the rest of the world. Now, if you look at where we're at now, I'd say there's two things, and I'm going to talk about these two topics. One is, I believe we're at the beginning of another industrial revolution. Um, and there's two things I'll describe. As one is the renewabilization of energy, and the second is the electrification of transport. And if you just give you an idea, this is 15% of global GDP at present. And uh, the question is, who's going to win on this going forward? If I was to put my money on it, it's going to be China. Okay? Um, it's not going to be the US, it's not going to be Europe. And the reason is, is because they understand this revolution, and they understand the opportunity that it brings. So let me just talk about renewabilization of energy. What does this mean? Be clear. I don't need oil anymore. I don't need gas. I need electricity. N none of our digital devices can, can actually function without it. You can't buy anything in a shop without it. You can't actually take money out of a bank without it. I mean, this is a massive change that we've seen in the last 20 years. We're totally dependent on this one energy source, which is electricity. And there's lots of different ways to produce that electricity, but we need electricity. We don't need oil and gas, right? The second thing I would say is, um, if you ask yourself, well, why do I think, you know, we, so we look at our device and we say it's all great, I actually will say to you that we will electrify heat and electricity. And we'll do so because of physics and economics. Physics is very simple, which is that electricity is much more economic, much more efficient than burning anything, right? So if you take an internal combustion engine, electricity in that car three times, four times more efficient than burning something in that car. Same thing in heating, right? If you're going to really do efficient heating, guess what? You're going to do heat pumps and stuff like this. Um, and I say economics is because economics also is the other driver. For me, it's very rational. If physics is wins, physics decides what happens long term, economics follows, right? And we're seeing that. The other thing, I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about in renewables. Uh, I've been in it, this area for quite a while is this just gives you an idea of fossil fuel generation that have been added every year. And this is basically coal and, and, and oil and gas. And then what you see is a massive increase in, in mainly wind and solar. But this year is a very interesting year because solar as a technology will be equal to, in terms of annual installations, of all other power generation technologies put together. Right? Just realize that, all put together. So there's something changing in our world. And I, as I said, renewabilization of energy. Um, I first looked at a solar company in, 2000, in 90, sorry, 2004. In 2004, the global market for solar was about 300 megawatts. This year, it's probably about 110 gigawatts, right? 
That's 110,000 megawatts. That's where we've gone to. We've never seen a technology in the energy space come to market as quickly as this. Never, right? If you think back in the oil industry, 1860, we're taking it out of the ground. Really, it took 50 years for oil to actually have a big impact on the energy space, right? The next thing I talk about is the electrification of transport. It's not just about electrification of transport. It's also the Uberization of transport. It's transport becoming a service. Um, I heard a statistic the other day um, in Germany. There are 20,000 commercial drones at work in Germany today. There are 100,000 drones in total in the country, right? This is a completely different way of doing it. If I look at electric scooters, just give you an idea of electric scooters, they're, they're, you know, they're being produced at millions a week, per week, at present, right? This is, the transport is going through quite a change. The other thing is back to economics and to physics. Um, internal combustion engine, efficiency of it really hasn't improved in 100 years. Um, I can hybridize it, which is what Toyota does, and they put a little bit of an electric engine in beside it, and you can improve the efficiency. Or you can go and do that, which is you go fully electric, 77%. I want to say about the 70 70%, it's very interesting, is that Tesla made one very simple um, addition to their car, the Model 3, which brought that efficiency from 77% up to 82%. And this is only one innovation in the power electronics space. So they did, in two years, what the automobile industry did in 100. Just realize this, right? This is, again, as I said, technology. If I was to look at costs, I took the US state of Minnesota against Germany. You can see economics of it makes sense now. But in particular, it makes sense if you're um, if you are a, a commercial user, right? That's why you do it. So let me just describe a little bit of what is driving this revolution, because this is very important, because if you're going to make investment decisions, you need to really get a handle around what's changing. And because if you get a handle of that, you get a, you get a handle around how fast to change. So let me talk, start firstly with digitalization. So the next step in digitalization is artificial intelligence. Um, both of us hear this, but we have no idea what it is. I just want to give a very simple example of this. This is Google's business, Apple Alpha Zero. Normally what happens is if you play chess and you play against a computer, what happens is the computer just goes through every single permutation, tens of millions of them, and then comes up with a decision. What Alpha Zero did was they said, actually, we'll learn from mistakes and from what others have done. And they don't go to 10 millions of moves, they actually manage to go to tens of thousands of moves. This means they're much faster. And very interesting is this is the way the human being works as well. We don't need to go and go through all the permutations. We sort of skip steps and come up with this. And those of you who play chess, you realize the madness of Alpha Zero, and I looked at it firstly. What this game continues to do is put the king in the middle of the board. And any of you who learn chess will say, you can't put the king in the middle of the board. But this is what this game is doing. And so you have chess masters looking at Alpha Zero saying, we've never seen methods like this. We've never seen strategies like what this game is doing. So we now have chess masters learning from this game. That's artificial intelligence. So where is it coming? The first use of it is without a doubt in cars and, and vehicles, right? And yes, it might be a, a while, it might be 10, 15 years away before we have it fully in our cars, but you're already, you're going to have it in our ports very, very quickly. You're going to have it with cargo movements, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there. Why? Economics. It's economics is why it's going to be. Get rid of the driver and you reduce the cost of transport. Okay? Pretty simple. And this is the, in Beijing. This is the longest traffic jam in history. It lasted six days. Okay. I mean, really, does anybody want that? No, they don't, okay? You want to be sitting in a car, if it's a car, and doing something else with it. The other thing I want to give you an idea of is digitalization. We're talking about 5G ramp up of technology and whatever. If I look today worldwide, we use about 2.5% of electricity demand goes into IT, right? Most of it mobile phones. I come from Ireland, Dublin, just to give you an idea of the scale of what Ireland is doing is that um, in the last five years, electricity demand in Dublin has doubled, and it's all because of data centers, right? This is Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on. But if you look at this graph here, and this is not from me, this is from nature, what you realize is, yeah, data centers will grow, but actually, 
the real thing that's going to happen is the internet, internetization of things. Everything's going to be connected together. That's the world we're going into. That's why we're arguing with the United States and China about 5G, because it's the same thing. It's power. We need much, much, much more power going forward, right? The other thing I would just say to you is environment. Um, I took this statistic from uh, the United Nations, which is that just every year, a country, an area the size of Poland is swallowed by deserts, right? And we could go into climate change and this, that, and the other. I'm not going to go into it, but the bottom line is we're having an impact on our environment. And the result of it is policymakers are making regulatory changes. Um, this just gives you an idea of sort of targets in China, Germany, Sweden for, you know, renewables, right? But again, it's not just renewables. It's, yeah, it's plastics, it's food, it's water. We all have a sort of, yeah, we have to change something. The other thing is, um, is a change in generation. Um, I see this in my own daughter. First word beyond mama and papa was iPad. Okay, you might laugh and say, oh my God, but she learns completely different than I do. She uses the iPad to learn all the time. She watches YouTube videos. I mean, this is very different. If I look at the generation that I am, and I look at this generation Z, they're pretty different. I mean, I had my daughter say to me, um, you know, why do I fly so much? It's bad for the, for the climate. She's eight years of age. Okay, I didn't, I didn't have anything like that in my head at eight years of age. But we have a generation change, and this, you know, call it technology. They have access to information that we don't have. The second thing is we're moving towards pay-as-you-go. I think we realize that ourselves. You don't own things anymore. You know, all, everything we're doing is pay-as-you-go. Why? It's cheaper, okay? And it's, uh, it's more comfortable to use and so on. And that's very, very important going forward. I don't need to own things. I can just use them as I need them. Um, other thing I would say is consumers are becoming environmentally aware, right? This is, this is our kids. This is our kids coming up and saying, we need to do something about this. It's affecting purchasing decisions, their purchasing decisions, our purchasing decisions. Um, I would all, this is stopped. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, let me look. So the other thing I would say is competition. Competition's great, because what competition does is it drives innovation, drives down price. But we have to realize that probably the main reason we have an inflation in the last 15 years is because of China. Keep driving down prices. They're now going into technology. And where 10 years ago, I couldn't name a Chinese company. Now there's a whole pile of these brands across the world. Um, I give one example of just to give you an idea of how far China is ahead. 99% of electric buses in the world are Chinese made. You cannot buy a bus from the big you know, bus manufacturers in the Western world. You cannot. Go to Daimler and they'll say, oh yeah, we'll deliver it in two years time. Okay? Go to BYD and they'll deliver it now. And all the buses in London will be Chinese. Right? In some form or other they will be Chinese. Um, I also want to say is that I, I, mean, I think China, what China's achieved is pretty amazing. You probably see this from a mining space, but you don't really think about what they've done. What they've done on the electricity generation space is they have created the United States in a decade. Right? They have added the power generation capacity of the United States in a decade. So the United States takes 100 years, they do it in 10. Right? That's why we've got this you know, boom in commodities. Um, what I also want to say as well is talking about economics is this is where we go, which is cost parity. We already, it's already cheaper to run an electric car, but when you, it's cheaper to buy the electric car, you can see what happens. Then you suddenly reach a tipping point that moves very quickly. Economics is also driving us to transport as a service. And remember, if you go autonomous, driver's gone, and guess what? None of us is going to own a car. Why would I own a car? It's a waste of money. Right? You might think of it as a status symbol. Next generation does not think of it as a status symbol. They just want to get from A to B. Other thing then is just give you an idea of improvements in, in, in costs. This just gives you an idea of the solar costs. You know, you've seen massive decreases in prices over the last years, the same in onshore wind, and there's further to come. Just, there's, there's, particularly on the solar side, you probably see another 50% reduction in costs over the next five years. Right? Um, the other thing then is economics. If solar is so cheap, remember, most of our chemicals comes today from gas, right? If I create ammonia or something like that, it comes from gas. If solar becomes so cheap, 
guess what happens? Then suddenly you change the chemical industry as well. You might say that might not happen, and, 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 but I just make a point that energy really drives everything. So what does this mean? Complexity. That's what it means for you guys, and I'll explain exactly what that is. Let's talk about the move to EVs. Great news for commodity guys is they're heavier. <laughs> that means there's more commodities, whatever it is, the different forms of metals in them, right? And that's great. But what I would say is there's also a move to new materials, in particular carbon fiber. The BMW i3 is carbon fiber hull, right? Just first mass production carbon fiber car. Lots of aluminum in it because you need to get it light. Other thing is quarter of this 400 kilogram gain is copper. And depending whether you use permanent magnets or not, it can actually be higher than that, right? Just realize a quarter of it's copper. Um, and what I think a normal car has probably about, about 20 kilograms of copper, so you're going to 100 kilograms of copper. Second thing is you're going to see reduction in certain materials, starting with steel. And steel is very simple. The engine block goes, exhaust, fuel tank, gearbox. They're just lumps of steel, right? 120 kilograms gone from it. Platinum, palladium, I don't need these materials anymore. I don't need to clean up the diesel or the gasoline anymore. Growth in batteries. Well, lithium is the long-term winner, and this is very important to understand this. The reason is this material, this metal, is very, it's very light. That's really, really, really important. Because if it's heavier, that means right, you've got energy density problems and stuff like this. And you see any of the next generation lithium technologies, lithium polymer, um, they're all using lithium. So I cannot see lithium actually being replaced in the next sort of 20 years as a material. So that's number one. Number two, I just want to give you an idea of the wind space. This is a Vestas 164 turbine. It's 105 meters up to the rotor there. If you think the diameter of the blades is about 180 meters, and it's 1,300 tons of weight. If you have it in concrete or foundation, the foundations are sometimes 1,500 tons of weight. Okay, 10,000 turbines sold a year. So did you give you an idea, you know, how much steel, concrete, carbon fiber, copper, and rare earths that go into this? I'll come back to rare earths in a second. Solar is also very interesting, but solar is pretty simple, because solar is basically gas, glass, it's, it's glass and silicon, so it's sand. All of it comes from sand, really, at the end of the day. But I want to give you an idea of the numbers of this that are, are, are sold. 500 million solar panels are sold per year. Just the, the number, just listen to the number. And you understand why mass production of that versus mass production of cars or mass production of something else, why they can get the cost down. Solar panel, 20 kilogram, guess what? It's very clearly the biggest industrial use for silver. Very clear, and there's no real alternative to it. Um, I also do important to say is, but be clear in all of this that there are alternatives. Um, so this is cobalt, and cobalt obviously very, it's a very important in batteries today because safety. It just really prevents fire, that's what it does, right? But you can decrease the levels of it going forward, right? And this is what you're seeing, NMC 111, you can see how much cobalt was in it, 50 kilowatt hour battery, 811 is where we're at now. You can see four. So we can decrease the amount of it going forward. And also, by the way, there are also alternatives to it as well. The second thing is rare earth metals. I want to just show you this. If this is an Enercon turbine, this is a Vestas. This Enercon turbine has no rare earth metals in it. It's a direct drive, no rare earth metals in it. It's, big, it's basically a ball of, cotton, of copper. That's what it is. By the way, BMW, electric cars, also the same, no rare earth metals in them. Vestas, Siemens, all the other turbine manufacturers, they actually use rare earth metals in their direct drives, right? So again, I just want to make a point that there are alternatives. Finally, I want to say that, you know, the, that in revolutions, strange things happen. This is, um, uh, I think they're from MIT. Their view is that what happens is, you go autonomous with the car, then what happens is, you don't need the car anymore. It's not a status simple. It's cheaper to go and just rent the car. And their view is that demand for cars will collapse. And if demand for cars collapse, then guess what happens? Then you, you, obviously, um, you, you obviously have an impact then on, on the materials that go into the cars. So what does this mean, really? And I left this till the end, is that if you look at uh, the fossil fuels, what's for me very, very clear is if I look at the fossil fuels, is that coal in the Western world, we have seen peak demand in the Western world. 
We're not far off seeing peak demand in the, in, in, in the Eastern world as well, in Asia as well. Um, oil, if I was to put my money on it, I'd probably say we're probably, I'd say we're probably seven years away from peak oil demand. Right? Just realize that phrase, not forget about supply, there's loads of it out there. And the reason is, one, it's electrification, but the second thing is, and I do believe this, that what happens is you will buy less cars, right? Um, so what does this mean? What this all means is that it's pretty difficult space for you guys going forward. But I just want to make the point as well at the end is that it really is an exciting time for all of us. Um, and it's an enormous opportunity because, as I said, we've got close to 15% of the world's GDP up for grabs over the next 10 years. At that point, I'll stop.